listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We are continuing our series in the English Reformation with the Reverend Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. McKenzie, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. All right. So last time we met, we were on the edge of our seats with what was going on with Henry VIII. This was wife number four, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And of Cleves. Okay. And the two Thomases. And there were two Thomases. Right. Yes. Right. Thomas Cranmer, Thomas Cromwell. That's right. Not similar at all. Not, <laughs> not, <laughs> not confusing, confusing at all. No, no. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where would you like to pick up then with King Henry VIII? Okay. I, I guess what I'd like to talk about is the failure of the more Protestant faction here in the late 1530s. The Anne of Cleves episode was just one example of their of their failure. And it's connected with who has the ear of the king. The king, this is all very personal government. So it's you don't have a lot of bureaucrats. You have people who are connected to the king in one way or another. And so he has people of various factions in his council. And sometimes he listens to this group and other times he listens to this group. Now, at the time of the break, it was the more Protestant group that he was listening to. And we talked about how they had success with legalizing the English Bible and then also with the dissolution of the monasteries. Cromwell wanted to create cr close alliances between the king and the Lutherans on the continent, and that failed. Basically, Henry VIII was never going to accept the Augsburg Confession, and the Lutherans were probably never going to say that Henry VIII was right to get a divorce. But maybe they could have ignored that because by the time we get to the late 1530s, Catherine is dead. Anne Boleyn is dead. Henry's third wife is dead. So, you know, it's kind of a fresh slate. But the Anne of Cleves fiasco, plus also the failure of Cromwell's diplomatic efforts, plus also Henry now listening to the traditionalist faction. And there are counterparts then to people like Cranmer and Cromwell. A political counterpart to Cromwell was the Duke of Norfolk, his name was Thomas Howard. He comes from one of the old families and is in a duke. And the religious counterpart to Cromwell was a fellow by the name of Stephen Gardner. He was the Bishop of Winchester. And Gardner was a persuasive person, Norfolk also, at least politically speaking. And they get the ear of the king. Now, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt their cause that Henry, almost at the same time as he's saying no to Anne of Cleves, is, is entering a relationship with one of the ladies at court. And her name is Catherine. I mean, if you, Anne or Catherine, those are like <laughs> just the names of people he marries. But anyway, her name is Catherine, and she is the niece of the Duke of Norfolk. So she's a representative, if you will, of the traditionalist side. And Henry not only dallies with her, he marries her. Now he's about 50 years old and she's like about 15 or 16 years old. So this is a really quite an unnatural match here in terms of age and really in terms of interest because Catherine Howard no sooner becomes Queen Catherine than she starts her own flirtations and dalliances and within a short time, she'll be in trouble for having committed adultery, just the way Anne Boleyn had been in trouble. But at least initially, it's the traditionalists who take advantage of this, and they have the ear of the king, and Henry decides enough of this movement toward Protestantism. I don't believe any of that. Theologically, I'm still a defender of the faith, and so we're going to double down on the old religion. So as I like to put it with my students, the Reformation in England under Henry VIII ends up with simply Catholicism in doctrine and practice, but without the Pope. So what they did that really made life difficult for the Protestant faction was to pass a law in Parliament. It's called the Six Articles Act. Henry was personally interested in this. He even went 
down to Parliament when they were debating it. This is in 1539. And this Six Articles Act, which eventually went through very much with the king's permission, outlawed public criticism of six items that are characteristic of medieval Catholic religion. The first was transubstantiation, the doctrine that in the consecration of the elements in communion, the bread and wine change into the body and blood. Bread and wine are no longer there. It's body and blood, no matter how it looks, tastes, or smells. That was first point. It was also illegal uh, to criticize communion in one kind only. Everybody had to be on board that communing in the bread only is fine and dandy. Third point was that the vows of chastity that monks and nuns traditionally took had to be kept. No release from the vows of chastity. That was closely related to point four, clerical celibacy. All the priests had to be celibate. Criticizing that practice was illegal. Then there was the sacrifice of the mass. Traditionally, priests, that's what priests did. They sacrificed the mass. People didn't go to communion. Priests just sacrificed the mass. And they did this as an offering to God for the sins of the living and of the dead. So it was like a continuation of what Jesus had done on Good Friday, but that was not once for all. That just got the ball started and we have to keep sacrificing his body and blood in private masses. That was five. And then the sixth one was the necessity of confessing your sins to a priest in order to receive forgiveness or absolution. Now, our listeners who are familiar with the sorts of things that Luther was opposed to will recognize that list. But now they have become the law of the land in England in 1539. And for being found guilty of all of those, well, I won't go into all the penalties, but if you were found guilty twice, it was the death penalty. And if you were found guilty just for the first time, denying transubstantiation, that was the death penalty by being burned at the stake. So at the end of Henry VIII's life, legally speaking, it's all over for the Protestants. This led to some of the bishops resigning. One of those is somebody that we've heard of before. That was Hugh Latimer. He was one of the early Protestants at the University of Cambridge. Well, he had linked himself up with Cranmer and Cromwell and had risen to the rank of bishop but he couldn't accept the Six Articles Act, so he resigned. And there was another one who resigned as well. Cranmer, interestingly, did not resign. In spite of his Protestant Lutheran leanings, he argued against the Six Articles Act, but when it became the law of the land, he stopped criticizing and agreed with it. The king had signed it, so Cranmer would say, well, I have to obey the... But this is also the same time when one of those early reformers, Robert Barnes, the English Luther, he had returned to England. He was preaching the gospel as a royal chaplain. This is when he is martyred, found con- found guilty of treason and heresy for continuing to preach against these things. And that's also when Thomas Cromwell falls from the king's favor. And he too is found guilty, kind of a quasi-legal procedure, but he is found guilty of treason and so he's executed. So when we get to 1540, it looks like, well, this is it. England's not going to obey the Pope, but there's certainly not going to be much room for evangelical Christianity. Well, it turned out not to be quite that way. Catherine Catherine Howard, whom I said, was found guilty of adultery, so she was beheaded. This meant the king was free to get married yet a sixth time, and he did. Another Catherine, so this, and she's Catherine Parr. She was a widow and she was really good for Henry in his last years. She took care of his children and the two children you want to think of are, who are still kind of little are Elizabeth. She's born in 1533. And so she's only about seven years old in 1540. And then her brother was born in 1536. So he's only about four. So Catherine makes sure that they're taken care of and that they have good teachers and she herself was kind of pro, pro-Protestant, or if not Protestant, at least in favor of the new learning, return to the scriptures and the like. 
And so the men that she hired to teach the royal children taught them kind of religion and piety that was different from that being practiced by their father and being mandated by the law. All was not lost for the for the Protestants. The Howard faction, Duke of Norfolk, is they're damaged by Catherine Howard, and they're also damaged by the Duke of Norfolk's oldest son. He, he starts thinking about what's going to happen when Henry dies. And he comes up with the notion, and I don't know the basis of whether this is true or not, that his family was descended from King Edward the Confessor. Now, for this, you have to go back to the 11th century prior to William the Conqueror. Edward the Confessor was the second to last of the Anglo-Saxon kings before William the Conqueror and the Normans took over England in 1066. So this silly son of the Duke starts to put Edward the Confessor's coat of arms, include that with his own coat of arms. So it kind of looks as if he's making a claim to being of royal descent maybe even better or different from that of the king. And obviously he was thinking that when Henry VIII dies, he and his dad are kind of take over and run the country. Well, instead of that happening, he gets arrested. And so does his father. And they're both found guilty of treason and put under a death sentence in the Tower of London. So that's a big name for the traditionalist Catholic side that's now out of place and out of power. Now, it turns out that The son did get executed. The father did not because Henry died between the two executions. And, you know, if you had a death warrant signed by one king and that king is dead, then the next king has to do something different with you. It doesn't just go from one reign to the next. So at any rate, at the time Henry dies, he has a council on which the big name Catholics are no longer present, but on which Cranmer is present as well as the king's uncle, and we'll talk about that when we, yeah, the king's uncle who is kind of a pro-Protestant and others who are maybe inclined in that direction. So Henry VIII comes to an end. He dies relatively peacefully. Cranmer is attending him when he dies. And Cranmer talks to him about the gospel and faith in Jesus and so forth. And Henry can't speak, but he kind of squeezes Cranmer's hand. And so we can speculate as to whether we're going to meet Henry VIII in heaven or not. It's kind of an interesting interesting thing to think about. (laughs) We need to take a quick break and we'll pick up the story right here. Talking with Dr. Cameron McKenzie, professor of historical theology at Concordia Seminary, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Sarah Golseth. I'm Andy Bates. We're talking with Dr. Cameron McKenzie, Professor of Historical Theology at Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, all about the English Reformation. And we are around the time of King Henry VIII's death. Where would you like to pick up with his story here? Well, let's just pick it up right there. I think we've pretty much done what we need to with Henry. and Everybody understands the state of the Reformation. He hasn't done much doctrinally. He hasn't done anything doctrinally, but there's put, there's potential there for change because there are still people in England who uh, would like the Church of England to move in a Protestant or Evangelical, Lutheran, whatever kind of word you want. They want to move it in that in that direction. And this was true on the King's Council. The King's Council now becomes a Regency Council because the king is now Edward VI. Now, who is Edward VI? Well, he's the son of Henry VIII by his third wife, 
Jane Seymour, both Catholics and Protestants had to acknowledge the legitimacy of Queen Jane. Notice that she's the only one not a Catherine or an Anne in that list of six. She, she was an English lady from an English noble family, and she caught the king's attention after the beheading of Anne Boleyn. They were married. She conceived. Uh, she gave birth to a son and promptly died. And of course, that was true about births for a very, very long time in human history because of everything that attended going into labor, delivering birth, including lots of post-birth infections. So anyway, she's dead. And that's when Henry can start marrying other people. But Henry finally does have a son. Now, that son is, Henry, Henry is, dies in 1547. And when he dies, Edward is nine years old. So he's not going to be able to rule personally. And what they did when you had a minor inherit the throne was to appoint uh, either one person to exercise authority in the child's name or a committee or a council. And Henry had left instructions in his will that his, his governing council should now become a regency council. And on this council, the Catholic voices were missing. The strong Catholic voices were missing. And Cranmer's voice is still there. And so is the voice of the king's uncle on his mother's side. He too is named Edward. He's Edward Seymour. He has a couple of noble titles. The one that he's usually remembered by is the Duke of Somerset. And very quickly, he becomes the dominant figure on that council. And in fact, they name him the protector of the realm. And as protector, he will be able to act in the name of the king. And so for a couple of years, the man who is exercising royal power in the name of the king is Edward Seymour. And Seymour belonged to the faction that believed in more reformation. Furthermore, young Edward, kind of a precocious kid, had he also believed in more reformation. He'd been raised by these tutors who were inclined toward Protestantism. And so now as king, under the influence of his uncle, England's going to move forward in a real reformation. So all of the stuff that Henry had tried to preserve in his Six Articles Act will now go by the board and we get a real authentic Protestant Reformation under Edward the Sixth. Now, what do I mean by a real Protestant Reformation? Well, there were lots of things. Uh, there, there are preaching, there's publications, books from the continent by Swingley, Luther and others. And there are men being promoted in the church who are Protestants, and we get Protestant bishops. Cranmer is now able to exercise kind of real theological leadership in the church. And so we get a, a move, quick move, in the direction of the Protestantism. Now, there we could spend a lot of time on this, but I'm not sure we should. So <laughs> let, let me just kind of highlight what happened. Edward's only on the throne for about six years. He dies when he's, I think, 16 years old, 15, 16, somewhere in there. And so he doesn't live long enough to make sure that his Protestant Reformation will survive him. But a couple of important things uh, did take place during his reign that came to characterize the uh, Church of England and Episcopalian offshoots even to this day. And one of those was the creation of a uniform liturgy in England for the use of all the churches in England. And this is something that we know today as the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer. And those of you who know the Episcopalian tradition know that even today, you know, you go to an Episcopalian church and they have a Book of Common Prayer. Well, the first one goes back to the reign of Edward VI, and it is basically the work of Thomas Cranmer. Uh, Cranmer knew that for worship to be effective for the people who were in church, it had to be in their language. And so 
almost the first thing they did was to permit preaching in English. And then after that, they put together a communion service in English. And that communion service allowed communion in both kinds, both in the bread and the wine. But finally, Cranmer came out with a book that included all of the services that a priest or pastor might need. It included the communion service, but it also included uh, matins and vespers. It also included uh, a service for baptism, for visiting the sick, for marriage, for uh, burial. The whole shebang was there. When it came out, it had to be, didn't have to be, but just as we saw under Henry VIII, here, the politicians, in this case, the Duke of Somerset, they want the authority of parliament behind this. So the Book of Common Prayer, prepared by Cranmer and others, was passed by parliament in 1549. It was passed in March 1549 and put into effect on Pentecost in 1549. And as I said, here we have for the first time in English history, not only a, a liturgy, in the English language, a complete liturgy, but it's going to be the same liturgy for every church in England. It's the book of common prayer, and that common means common to all the churches of England. It, it was really kind of an exciting moment. Um, now, from the standpoint of Lutherans or people interested in theology generally, you want to know, well, what about the theology of the book? Is it still Catholic or in English though, or is it Protestant? What is it? Well, basically it's a Protestant book. Lots of things that were characteristic of Catholic worship were left out. Not everything was left out. So, so for example, in the prayer right before communion, there is a remembrance or commemoration of the saints especially the Virgin Mary. Now, it's not a prayer to the saints, but a commemoration of the saints, especially the Virgin Mary. And then a distinction between the saints and all others who die in the faith for whom you pray that God would take care of them. So it's kind of like, eh, do we have the saints up in heaven? There's no purgatory, but it's not clear that people who die in the faith end up in heaven among the saints. So there's that kind of ambiguity in the book. Another good example of this, I know we're running out of time here, but I'll just mention this quickly, is they consecrate the elements and then they don't distribute the elements and they talk about the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And you could kind of read that as kind of the sacrifice of the mass. It's really just kind of unclear. And in fact, it was so unclear that one of the traditionalists of the previous reign, Stephen Gardner, the Bishop of Winchester, he thought he could live with the book. So, so it ends up being a first step. Now, I see that we're running out of time here, so maybe this would be a good place for us to conclude, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the second book when we get together again. That sounds fantastic. Man, so much in this history. I love it. I do too. I'm looking forward to next time. Thank you so much for joining us and for this great series with us, Dr. Cameron McKenzie. Thanks for a guest again on the Coffee Hour today. You're very welcome. I'm enjoying it. You've been listening to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.